Start in five seconds. Five, four. Good morning. Welcome to church. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to church. <laughs> welcome to church. Oh, that's funny. So uh, I'll just let you guys in on a secret too. So I've recorded a handful of videos for all sorts of different things here at church. And I have to do a lot of takes. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes and I'm like tripped up. I always mess up at the beginnings too. All right, <laughs> we'll start again in three seconds. Good morning, welcome to Quest. We are so glad you are here. Uh, this is Jonathan Walker and Quest students from Youth Group on Wednesday night. Hi. 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 We are so glad to welcome you to our church this morning and glad to have you joining with us. We wanted to welcome you. And if you're new, we're especially glad that you are here. And uh, so we're our youth group here at Quest. And we wanted to tell you what life is like as a teenager in our world today. So uh, what's life like? Sometimes boring. Kind of boring, yeah. Pretty chill. Pretty boring and a lot of schoolwork. Yes, lots of schoolwork. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne's smiling because she's the teacher. <laughs> Zooming. Totally, a lot of uh, Zoom. It's a lot of fun because I'm experiencing more freedom than I've had in a number of years. Lots of freedom. Will's having fun. I go skateboarding a lot. Yeah. Well, good to good to hear from you guys and and share. It's a uh, it's an interesting world we're living in right now, and trying to wrap up our school year. So thank you all uh, for your prayers for our our ministry for our students, and uh, the ups and downs of life right now with the challenges and the parts that are boring. So thanks for your support, Quest, and. Mm -hmm. We uh, are happy to welcome you to our church. So up next, we have The Skinny to tell you what's coming up and what's going on. So we all want to welcome you and now say bye. 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 It's announcement time. So here's The Skinny on what's going on in Quest. We are still doing our New City Fellowship work days, but we're being really careful about social distancing. We will only do outside projects like yard work or other outdoor repairs. We'll see you down there on Saturday, May 9th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., but be sure to bring work gloves, a face mask, and your lunch. You can contact Mel Brown if you have any questions. Are you involved in a small group of some kind? We have several going on within Quest that meet via Zoom. Right now, especially, it's important to make sure that you're connected to other people, and this is a great way to do that. If you're interested in joining a small group, please contact Kevin Hughes at kevin.hughes at questchurchstl.org, and he'll help get you plugged in. Our all-church Tuesday night Zoom gatherings will continue through May. Join the group to touch base, see some familiar faces, catch up, and pray together for a few minutes. You can find the link to the next one on our website event page or in our email newsletter. Our website is the hub for all Quest-related information, and you can find that at questchurchstl.org. You can also follow Quest's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages for the latest news and updates about the church. Well, hi, Quest. There's some things we'd like to, to know that we've been thinking through uh, as elders and as leaders uh, in Quest. We have seem to have entered into kind of a whole new season of this epidemic and the process that we are going through, uh, both as a world, as a nation, as a state, and even in the St. Louis region. And so this coming Monday on the 4th, there's going to be kind of a reopening of things here in Missouri. But in the county and in the city, things are different because things in the rural areas of Missouri are actually different than they are in the urban and suburban parts of our state. And so this whole issue of reopening uh, brings all sorts of issues and decisions with it. And we've been getting uh, questions from a lot of people on, well, what are we going to do as Quest and uh, what's happening there? And instead of giving you all the details, because we don't know all of them yet, I want to just communicate a framework of thinking that we have that might help you understand 
how we're going about it. So I usually think of this in terms of uh, almost a painting or a picture. And in the middle of that would be this issue of reopening uh, the issues and the decisions that surround that. And to help us think it through, I like to think in terms of building a framework around that issue. And so in Quest, well, let's see if we can kind of build a framework around it. The things that will kind of guide us and kind of create uh, the edges to this whole thing. Now, the first thing we want you to know, maybe up here at the top, would be that we are committed to being prudently careful. Um, that doesn't mean we can be perfectly careful, but we want to be prudently careful. We want to be responsible uh, leaders that would establish a really good way about going this, and the key word being careful. We're going to be careful. This is nothing to be flippant about. It's nothing to be cavalier about. That proves nothing except just to kind of uh, expressing our demand for liberty. Uh, but we want to be prudently careful with how we go about this. Now, on the other side of that frame at the bottom, uh, we have this truth that we need to wrestle with and embrace, is the fact that we cannot guarantee 100% free, 100% uh, germ-free environment or experience. It's just not realistic. Uh, there are germs out there, and so there's the flu germ, and there's a cold germ, and, and there's all sorts of things that can happen. We can't guarantee that nothing negative will happen. I think that's been one of the challenges in this uh, whole process, is that we would really like for things to be guaranteed. We'd like it to be kind of perfect. Uh, we want uh, this the fragileness of our lives to not really affect us. And the reality is we can't guarantee 100% germ-free experience. Now, having said that, let me go back to the top and say, but we can work really hard at being prudently careful. And so this kind of helps us think we can't be perfect, but can, we can be really careful and be prudent and responsible in this process. Now, let's over on the left-hand side, see if we can put a, an edge on this frame. There are going to be national, state, and county orders and guidelines. We're committed to taking those seriously. Not only do we think that people are trying to lead as best they can and that they have an expertise that, frankly, we don't have, but we also respect the, the fact that God has told us to honor those who are in government over us, those who are in leadership over us. And so we really want to trust our national, state, and county leadership and the orders and the guidelines, both to respect them, but to respect all the people around us. So we're going to take those seriously. They will begin to help us make decisions. Now, those are fluctuating. They change. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, an environment that's not always settled. And so we know and we understand that it takes time uh, to do that. Now, on the other side of that, not only will the state and the, uh, the nation and the state and the county make decisions, but we have a responsibility over here on the right side of this frame to make clear protocols that we will say, here's how we're going to function. And those protocols will be designed to protect the safety of our congregation in how we do things, but not only our congregation, but we feel that responsibility to have clear protocols that will protect the safety of our community. Because once we come into Quest, if when we do, and when we leave, we're going back into a community that is trusting us to protect them also and to respect them and put them high on our priority list to protect them. So we're going to be prudently careful. We're going to understand we can't be 100%. We're going to follow the guidelines and the orders uh, of our nation, state, and county. And we're going to establish clear protocols. So on this next one, next slide, over here with the state, national, and county orders and guidelines, they're still establishing those. The state will have some, but they have allowed the county and the city, because of their particular needs, to create those. Right now, it seems a little indefinite in the county. And so we're a little indefinite too, though some of the possibilities we're thinking through what we might do. And what that will lead us to do then over here uh, on the right side of the frame, well, to think through what will we require before people arrive at Quest? 
what will we require at a worship service and how we will handle those things, what will be okay and what won't be okay, and maybe uniquely what we do with Quest Kids because they will have some particular needs and limitations that uh, adults may not have because kids will be kids, right? So that's how we're going about our framework of thinking through how we're going to handle uh, this reopening process. It's still going to be a process. We don't know all the particulars yet, but we'll get there. All right. I hope that answers your questions and helps you know that we are thinking this through and we do have plans, but we're doing them uh, at the proper time and hopefully in the proper way. All right, you guys, we'll look forward. We'll keep you updated on all the particulars about this process. Thank you. Take care. Hey, and one more thing I forgot to tell you. Uh, this coming week, probably on Tuesday, we're going to put out a thing called a Survey Monkey, which is going to be an anonymous survey, five questions, that will help uh, us get feedback from you on your comfort level and involvement level as you think about re-entering into Quest also. So uh, look forward to, to, to seeing that and taking that uh, this coming week, starting on Tuesday. All right. Hey, thanks again. Hey friends, it's Luke from the worship team. It's a new month and a month of growth beyond the celebration that is Easter Sunday. The sun is out, things are growing and blooming all around us, and there is new life everywhere. Our worship today comes from two places, but from a central thought that for us to grow in Christ, we need the death and resurrection, but we also need the spirit that he promised us to be a reality in our lives. The spirit of a living God was promised for us one to interact on our behalf, to be a mediator for us, and to guide us. The God that we serve has a deep and profound love for us. Our God is living and active and at work in our lives through the Holy Spirit, and that is something that gives us hope and a future. So today as you come and as you worship, let the Spirit of God fill you and be mindful of the great price that was paid for us once and for all. Thank you.
so much goodness. It's such a good song. Good morning. Welcome to Quest. I'm Jonathan, and I am so happy to get to be with you this morning as we worship, as we study God's Word. And thank you, Luke, for leading us with some great songs and pointing us to God and His character and His love for us and how deep and unfathomable it is. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today, which is great. Uh, thanks for helping us worship in our homes. Uh, it's kind of unique, very unique, but uh, you're really helping us. So thank you, Luke, and your team. Now, uh, I want to give you a little window into life here in the Walker household uh, here during our kind of stay, our, our quarantine, hanging out inside. Uh, life with a toddler. We're having a lot of fun teaching Zoe, helping her grow up, uh, just learning different foods and items and, and trying to connect words with actions and things that are happening. So right now, uh, one of the, the things she's been learning is like, parts of our bodies like ears and nose and what her favorite right now is eye and she jabs your jabs her eye and she's like where's the eye yeah and it's a little little scary uh, but she loves it which is fun uh, and we're also trying to teach her in the ways we can she's 16 months old trying to teach her what god is like <laughs> eyes nose ears and god uh, it's kind of a, a nebulous concept for, for a toddler and really kind of a, a challenging concept for all of us. What is God like? And uh, so the best we've got so far is trying to help her learn to pray. Like we pray every day at certain times like meals or when we're reading at the end of the day, we pray. And so we go, our hands together, pray, pray. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this. We love you. Thank you for dying for us. And we try to explain it all. And the best we can get is her to go like this when we pray. And uh, occasionally she'll say amen at the end. When we say amen, she goes amen. So she kind of goes amen. And it's cute. It's fun. And then I get my camera out to video it. And she never does it when we get the camera out. That's just how these things go, I guess. And uh, I think she's doing it intentionally. Uh, so that's what she's got about God. We pray to him. Amen. It's just cute. It's, it's fun. Uh, but it's a big question. And it's a question we have to wrestle with. How do we communicate this to, to our kids? How do we grapple with it ourselves? And we're in the middle of a series starting to dig into these ideas of what is God like? That's our question this morning. Now, uh, the last couple weeks, we started the series called What and Why? Answers Grounded in Faith and Hope. And we're uh, jumping off of these verses in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 15, where Peter writes to these suffering Christians to encourage them to be able to give an account when they're asked, when, when they're faced with it, to give a reason for the hope that is in them. And that's what we want to do in the series is to help us as, a, as the body of Quest, the body of Christ here, to be able to give an account, a reason for why we believe what we believe, but not just intellectually, but for something that has gripped our hearts, to have a hope, a certainty of who God is, his work in this world. And then Peter writes that we should do so with gentleness and respect, that that's how we bring this to others, with gentleness and respect. And last week, we started with, uh, we're, we're each week saying, I have hope because, and starting with some foundational ideas. Last week, Kevin talked about, I have hope because there is a God, that God is real, that that's a reality. And he engaged in a lot of theological, philosophical questions, uh, some arguments for God uh, from a lot of different perspectives, from scripture, from science. It was really, really helpful to start to think about the fact that God is real. And because he really exists, there is a hope we have in our hearts, in our minds, in the way we live our lives. Uh, but it starts with us acknowledging that there is a God. And uh, then the follow-up question immediately is, well, then if there is a God, what is he like? What is he like uh, if he's real? And how do we know? And for us today, we want to dig into what the Bible says about who God is. And uh, we don't want to just make up, well, I think God is this way or that way because we like it or it makes us feel good. Uh, we as Christians are coming to the authority of Scripture to say, what does the Bible have? What does Scripture have to say about who God is, about what he is 
like? So that's our question. And today our big idea is that God, we have hope because God is infinite and he is personal. Kind of trying to sum all theology up into, I have hope because God is infinite and personal, uh, which is uh, a, a big concept. So in the next 25 minutes, we're going to try to cover everything that of what God is, what everything that the Bible has to say about, about God and who he is. Uh, you know, Krista, uh, she told me this story when she was in fifth grade, she uh, had a paper to write and she was excited about it. And she went to her teacher and said, hey, I want to write a paper on the ocean. Nice. And Krista brought that to her teacher and her teacher looked at her and said, Krista, can we narrow it down a little bit? And the ocean covers most of our planet. It has filled with tremendous depth and filled with all sorts of different things. You're gonna write a paper on the whole thing. Let's just like narrow it down a little bit. So that's what we're trying to do this morning to say, what is God like? Well, he's infinite and he is personal. He is both, uh, maybe other ways to put this is to say he's He's big, he's transcendent, he's all present, all powerful, all good, all knowing. That's the infinite side, right? He's absolute, he's perfect, the total perfection, and his goodness and righteousness and holiness and all that. And then related to that though, is that he's also personal. He's a being, he relates to us, he's, he's relevant, he's engaged, he's involved, he's real, and he wants us to know him. And it's this, this dynamic of relationship. So he's both infinite and personal. That's our, our kind of overarching idea this morning. We have hope because that is what God is like. Now, uh, we're going to unpack a bunch of different scripture that covers kind of a variety of elements on this, on God being infinite and God being personal. Uh, but really, really quick, I just want to highlight that we don't really want to approach God just from a, an academic mindset to say this is what God is like and this is a theory and this is the box that we have him in. That's not really the way scripture presents God. Scripture opens with a story. In the beginning, God. That's the presupposition for the entire thing that God exists before creation. He created and he made the world and he made it good and power and showed his power with creation and building and in his majesty and his dominion he showed it all right the infiniteness the all goodness the, the all powerfulness by speaking he creates but then he creates human beings to relate to them to walk with them in the garden in his creation to live in this world he is infinite and personal that's the god of scripture from the very beginning pages and it's not in a textbook fashion well first god is infinite subpoint b he is infinite in his transcendence. That's not the way it works. It's, it's a God who is act, 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 active and engaged with his world. It's a, it's a story, right? The Bible wasn't just a dictionary or encyclopedia. It's, it's a story of God creating the world. But also when the, the world is broken because of human sin, he is personally engaged. He takes his power, his strength, and uh, channels it into working to redeem what is in the world. He personally cares in, in this world. And that's the story of all scripture. And there is tremendous hope there, which we need. We need a sense of the idea that God and his, his character, who he is, it, it's going to bring redemption in our lives, right? We need hope like that because we look for, for hope and certainty and life in all the wrong places. That's what we saw last week in Romans 1, that that we turn to idols. We put our hope in the created things of this world and not our creator. So we need hope by looking to who God is. There's certainty there. When circumstances are messy, there is a hope there that we can hold on to uh, through all sorts of ups and downs. And as we look into reopening all sorts of things in our, in our society, in our, our city, uh, there's a lot of fear and questions and things we're trying to wrestle with. And we often are, are looking for some sort of hope in the midst of hardship. 
And, and I think we need to work desperately for, for God's wisdom to be involved in this process. We need his, these attributes of him being infinite, personal, here and now. But we need to engage first and foremost with the God who brings hope because that is who he is. And that is the hope that he brings into our world. So let's dive in into the ideas of God being infinite and God being personal. Let's start with God being infinite, his, him being transcendent, his being over and above, his being uh, absolute. Now, this uh, maybe another way of putting it is that the omnis, omniscient, all-powerful, uh, omnipotent is all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, he's omnipresent, he's present all over. He's not in everything, but he's present in, in this world. These, these attributes show an incredible picture of God. And part of this is about his sovereignty, that he is, he is the ruler. He is, uh, he is the one in charge. It's not us, it's, it's him because he is God. And I wanna to look to Psalm 113, one to nine, uh, for some, some of the theology that begins to, to point at this. And this is a Psalm of praise. It says, praise the Lord, Praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Here it is. The Lord is high above all nations. He's transcendent. He's infinite. And his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes them sit with princes and with princes, the princes of his people. And he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. The Psalm gives a picture of God, his transcendence, his greatness, his goodness. Who is like him? Look back with me at verses five and six. He says, who is like God, the Lord, our God? He's seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. Who's like the Lord? Now here in, in our Bibles, our English Bibles, it says Lord, and it's in all capitals. And that's, uh, that's the Hebrew word Yahweh, which means, uh, it's, which is God's name. It's not the Hebrew word that means Lord. It's the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is God's name personal name. We'll come back to that. But it's his name, the name of God. He says, praise, who is like Yahweh, our God, who is seated on high. He's the transcendent one. He is the infinite one. And he looks down over heaven and earth. He's the one, he's, he's over at all. Who is like him? And he is the one who's worthy of our praise. But then what's so cool in the psalm is all around it, it's this, this calling for praise and then saying, and his character, his goodness, his, his all power, it's at work in this world for the downtrodden, the lost, the broken, the hurting. And he, he talks about the poor who sits in dust. He lifts them up to princes or the, the woman who is without child. He makes for her a home, the mother of children. This God, all through scripture, he is involved in this world, right? It's the infinite personal side. Who is like him? The greatness of him, it's, it's overwhelming. Now, maybe one way of kind of illustrating this is to say, well, here's God. I got it on the screen for you. Here's God. And then we have a line. And then there is, on the bottom, uh, creation, or not God. Create creatures, all of us. There's God, and then there's not God. And God is totally unlike anything else in this world. He alone is God. We aren't, creation isn't, human beings are not God. Uh, we look for things in this world to be our gods, to, to be our satisfaction, our hope, but only God himself. On the other side, that's who God is. He is he's infinite, he's transcendent, right? He, the, the bigness of who he is, uh, the greatness of his character, it is, it is totally holy. It's unique. It's set apart, uh, unlike anything else in, in all the world, in all of creation. So there's God, there's creation, none like him, none who, who rule. And maybe another aspect of God being infinite is the idea that God is completely independent. 
or, or he's completely self-sufficient. The, the $5 theology word is he's assay, his aseity. Uh, it's his, his self-sufficiency. His, he's on his own. Paul, when trying to explain who God is to the, the Greeks in Athens in Acts chapter 17, he says this in verse 25. He's, uh, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind and breath and everything. Now in Athens, there's temples to all sorts of gods all over the area. And he says, now look, all the priests there serving them, doing things for that God so that they can be fed and be pleased and satisfied. So God isn't like that. No, he's, he's the God who, who made all of this. He doesn't need these sort of things. He's actually the one who gives breath, who gives life. He is the self-sufficient one. He is the independent one. And we are the dependent ones, dependent on who he is. That's, that's a picture of just who God is, how big he is. Uh, he, he's self-sufficient. He's self-sufficient. Now, n related to that uh, is the ideas of his character, not just of kind of his existence, but of his character, what he is like. And just want to look at a couple of verses in Psalms, Psalm 147. We're going to see that God being infinite, it includes his immeasurable greatness, his power, his understanding. Uh, so Psalm 147, 1 to 6, you can follow along. He says, the psalmist says, For it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant. A song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wound, wounds. He determines the number of the stars. Right? He's the sovereign one. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Look back with me at verse 5. It kind of summarizes some key ideas of God and his infinite, immeasurable goodness. It says, great is our Lord. Just incredibly great, abundant in power, all powerful. And his understanding is beyond measure. There's no ruler that will show how great it is. His understanding extends beyond. That is who he is. But then also that, that incredible depiction of his character is once again rooted in his action for his people. His, he's personal. Right, he, uh, he binds up those who are hurting. He heals the brokenhearted. He lifts up the humble, but he casts down and takes down the wicked. This is who he is. His character, his attributes are expressed in his activity in this world for his people uh, because he cares. Now, Paul has a great picture of this. Uh, it's one of my favorite prayers that he prays, uh, prayers that he prays. In Ephesians, and I want to jump over to Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul, uh, praying for the Ephesian church, he says in verses 14 to 21, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. This is why I'm praying. For whom every from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. That, so that, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, the Ephesian church, you'd be rooted and grounded in love. And then this is a great verse. He says, may you, that you may have strength, strength to comprehend with all of the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God's love, it surpasses knowledge. It is so infinite. It is so incredible. It surpasses capacity of understanding. And Paul's praying that we would get a, a glimpse of that, a, a little grasp on that. Uh, and then he says that you may be filled with the fullness of God, that he'd be present. And then though, in verse 20, he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, and all that we ask or think, according to the power 
at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And he, he doesn't end the letter there. That's like the halfway point. But he just breaks out into praise and prayer because he starts to, to lift these people up before the Lord, praying that, that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that they would grow in the knowledge of Christ. And then he prays that they would begin to understand how incredibly infinite his love is for them. And then he roots it next with, man, he is a God who is able to do far more immeasurably than we can even ask. He's more powerful and incredible and able to do more than we ask. And it's him that all the glory goes to. He is the great one, the, the transcendent one, the glorious one, the infinite one, the infinite one. He alone is God. So this, I mean, it's a handful of verses, and I'm pulling from, from the Psalms, from the New Testament, trying to give a picture of this is something that is really pervasive of every page of Scripture, of who God is, of his greatness, of his goodness, the, the, the fullness of his character, the perfections of his character, the beauty, the moral purity, all of it. it it's part of him being infinite. And uh, that, that means it's not just abstract for us when we talk about, I have hope because God is infinite. Well, that, that seems like a very abstract thing to say. But when we look at the perfections, how absolute God's character is, that's the idea behind him being infinite or being transcendent, his him being over all of this, him being God and us being creation. That gives us an incredible hope. That gives us incredible hope. Uh, the transcendence of God, the infinitiness, infinite, infiniteness of God, it, it gives us a certainty of his character, a certain grasp of his power. It means that he is faithful to stay true, that he is reliable for you and me in our times of need. It means that he's bigger than the hardship. He's bigger than the world that we're in, the mess that we see, the confusion, the tension, trying to make sense of it. He's bigger than it. His knowledge exceeds it. His greatness is over it. And, and that, that gives us incredible hope to come to him, to ask for help, to pray for, for his greatness to be at work in our lives, to get a picture that he's bigger than the trial, than the hardship. Now, now part of this is the idea that God is sovereign, that he is the ruler over the whole world, everything in it. And we're actually uh, going to pick this up more next week because this is an incredible aspect of God's character, that he's sovereign and providential. But when we when we start to gra get a grasp on God being infinite, and then we look at the world and we see the broken parts and the mess and the evil, uh, whether it's the coronavirus or all sorts of other evil, messed up things in this world that are not the way it's supposed to be, we start to wonder, well, if God's totally, perfectly good and he's ruling over this world, there's this hardship and uh, trying to make sense of who God is in the light of a broken world. That question is so big, we're going to talk about it next week. So hang on to your, to your thoughts, to wrestling with it. Right now, I just want us to get a grasp, uh, start to, to think about the majesty and greatness of God being infinite, his perfection, his transcendence, because it does give us hope. And next week, we'll unpack uh, uh, the reasons why we have hope in him being sovereign and providential, even in the midst of a broken world. Uh, that that's there's hope there to be found too but it, it root, is rooted in God being infinite now God also uh, him being infinite his bigness doesn't mean though that he's not relatable that he's not someone who's knowable no the picture in scripture is also that God is very personal that we can connect with him that we can embrace him and know him and be known by him and that he wants us to to engage with him in that level uh, in a relationship. So let's turn now to talk about God being personal. And the picture in scripture is not just that he's personal, but also that he's tri-personal. It's kind of founded in the idea of the Trinity, that God himself is in a relationship with himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, together in a loving 
united, mutually glorifying, lifting up love relationship uh, that is just intimate and close, a deep friendship that is within God himself. That the, the reality of all that God is, the foundation of it is God being relational, loving being. And that that relationship is, is something that extends to how he wants us to know him and for us to know others, to be made in his image. It's, it's a relational component of being personable. And I want to unpack just a few uh, ways we see that in scripture. God is uniquely personal. And first, it's that God reveals his name. His name. Now look with me at Exodus chapter 3. We looked at this a little bit last week where Kevin uh, was talking about the existence of God. Moses, this is in the burning bush encounter. Moses is speaking to God. Uh, he, uh, God is going to send him back to Egypt to deliver his people. And uh, he, they have this amazing interaction. Look with me at Exodus 3, 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses is gone, they say. Hey, you're saying God has sent you to us? Well, what's his name? What God? Who, who is he? And then verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And Kevin talked last week how this is about God. Uh, part of it is God being self-existent. I am who I am. Uh, it's, it's, he is the self-sufficient one. He is, he's independent. He's unique. He is the only God. Uh, that is who he is. And then he continues in verse uh, 15. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, and that's the Hebrew word, Yahweh. It's his, it's his name. Uh, this is the name. Say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, he has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So when Moses goes back, he used to say, Yahweh sent me. And Yahweh is the, the same God, He's, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, our ancestors. He's the God who's been personally promising and covenanting with his people to say, I am going to deliver you. I'm going to, through you, bless all the nations of the earth uh, through Abraham, through the people of Israel. And so God, he remembers his people. He, he goes to his people. He sends Moses to them. It's this amazing picture of God revealing uh, a name. He's not just like the English word God is kind of generic. Well, what God? There are gods, God, what God? And then uh, here, though, it says, well, it's Yahweh, the God of Israel. It's this picture of, a, of an intimate relationship. God wants to be known by a name. And it, it's just incredibly cool when you see this in Scripture. You see God revealing himself through uh, his name, through his person. He's not just any God, uh, but he's real, and he's the only one, and he has a name. And then uh, we see another picture. So God, he reveals his name, but he also reveals himself in all sorts of ways. So look with me at Psalm 19. We see God revealing himself through his speech. In Psalm, Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God like speaking language. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. Lord, in verse 7, the law of the Lord, the law of Yahweh, is perfect Revives, reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. On Psalm 19, the psalmist gives glory and praise to God through his speech and creation, and also his speech through his word, through the law, uh, saying the, God speaks, he reveals himself. The world we're in, the sky, the mountains, the earth, it's proclaiming something. It's saying there's a creator behind this. 
It's pouring forth speech day after day after day. God reveals himself through through nature. And we saw in Romans 1 last week that, that his power and greatness are on display there through creation. And we need to respond to that. That's it points us to God. He reveals himself. But he's also a God who speaks. He gives his word. He gives his law. And, and it's to revive the soul. It's to replenish, to refresh, to heal. For God to say, this is what I'm like. This is what I want you to be. This is my law. It's perfect. It's great. It's complete. God is a God who reveals himself. He doesn't want us to be lost on our own. He wants us to have in the last phrase, it says, enlightening the eyes. He wants us to be able to see him, to know him, to relate to him. Uh, so he reveals himself in creation, through his word. Uh, he's a God who wants to be known. He, he wants to be related to. Now, uh, to jump over maybe to one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, in uh, the book of John, Jesus uh, in John chapter 17 has spent a lot of time with his disciples. This is the night before Jesus, uh, the night Jesus was betrayed. This is the night of the Last Supper. And he uh, has this famous prayer for his people, for his disciples. And so in John 17, 3, Jesus says this. He's praying for them and he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you that his disciples, his people, would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is eternal life, that they would know the true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. This is who Jesus is. He, he wants us to know him, to know God, to know who he really is. And that relational component, getting connected to the God, who breathes life through Jesus, that brings eternal life. That connection there, that relationship there, that personal bond, God's bigness and his personalness coming together to give life. And that's what Jesus is praying for, for his people. So God being personal, how does that give us hope in a time like this? Um, he's big, he's fit, infinite, but he's personal, he's real, he is close. He is near to us. Uh, what does it mean to us? First, it means that God is involved in this world. He's not aloof. He's not kind of lost, like surprised, like, oh, the coronavirus? What's happened there? No, he, he knows. <laughs> he cares. He's not surprised. He, he is intimately involved in our world. Uh, it's not that he is far from us, but he actually wants to walk with us through these days, through the challenges, the hardships, the ups and downs, he wants to walk with us, to be known. Uh, and it means that God desires for us, and being personal, he wants us to listen to him, to hear him. And in these days, um, there's a, a ton of things beckoning for our attention, whether it's work or our news feed. There's a lot of, a lot of voices. And in the midst of it, God being infinite and personal, we want to get a glimpse of what God has to say for each of us. That's, that's my cat. My cat is, is at the door. Hold on one second. I will be right back. This is how preaching from your home basement works. You, it's just, I have some stuffed animals set up and now I have my, my cat here. Uh, so God is personal. He wants us to hear his voice, to come to know him. And we need to think about this on a few levels. What is God saying to you and to you personally, to you individually? How is God reaching you? What might God have to say to you in these moments? For me, I've, I've needed the reminder of God's presence, that he is with me through his spirit, through Christ. He is present with me. That has been a tremendous encouragement for me to think about God and his presence, his involvement in the, in the midst of craziness and confusion and trying to make sense of the world. He's with me. What might God have to say to you? That he's both big, he's personal, he cares, and he wants you to know him. Maybe if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus or to turn to God, today is a perfect day to do that, to, to think about and to ponder more 
the nature of who God is and his love for you through Jesus, his death in your place, his resurrection life that can be offered to you, the eternal life that Jesus prayed for, for his disciples. Um, what might God have to say to you? And also, I think we need to say, because God is personal, what does he want to say to Quest, to the Quest Church, the people uh, in our, our circle? And uh, I don't know all that God would have to say for us. I'm, I'm not a prophet who can say, thus the Lord says to Quest. But I think God is inviting us to ask the question, what is he trying to say to us as a community, as Christians wanting to live for him in our world? He wants us to, to figure out how to be the people that he has made us to be for his glory, for the good of our community. What does he have to say to Quest? Just be thinking about that. Be thinking about what God might be saying to our community and what he might be calling us as a church to. And lastly, I want to talk about what is maybe God saying to the world. In these days, uh, once again, I'm not a prophet. I don't know what God is saying to the world. But I think the gospel message, the, the picture of hope that is there, is something that God is inviting us to. That God wants our world to see. Uh, that that we, uh, we should be grieving about the hard things. It's not supposed to be this way. But to also have a hope. A hope that gives us strength to work for the good now. A hope that gives us certainty about the future. And a hope that is rooted in God being infinite and personal. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the, the beauty of this, that in John 1, 14, John is writing, he says, And the word became flesh. God came in the person of Jesus, and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. There is a hope in what Jesus has done. And God, remember that line, and there's God and then there's creation, there's us. God entered in. He, he entered into our world. He, uh, it said he, he dwelt among us. And the word there is a word that means tabernacle. He set up a tent, moved in down the street. But a tabernacle like the temple and the tents that he would meet in his people to be present with his people. The bigness of who God is, his all-powerfulness, his all-presence, his all-goodness, his all-knowledge, all of it come in the person of Jesus to be with his people, to bring hope, to enter into our, uh, our world, the creation, in order to redeem it, to set it right, to make it new. That is what Jesus came to do. And that, that's a hope that we, when we see God's infinite and personalness, it, it drives us to worship, drives us to, to get a glimpse of the majesty of, of God's love for each of us, for this world, of what he went through in order to make it right. And that he is still working, uh, that he, he is determined to bring about a new creation in this world. And that, that is a hope that does not disappoint, that does not leave us uh, empty. Uh, so as we close, uh, I want us to just take a moment to pray, um, to pray for, for God to be revealed in this world, for him to be revealed in our lives and in our community. Uh, so will you pray with me? Father God, it's hard to get a grasp on how big you are or even how personal you are, but we begin to see it when we look at Jesus. And we see it so clearly how you show your power and your healing and over, over the darkness and, and your, your knowledge and wisdom you bring. But you also show your love and, and closeness to be with us in order to redeem us and from the, the sin, the corruption, the, the death that takes over uh, and it doesn't have the final say because you have overcome death. Uh, so we thank you, God. We thank you for showing your infinite power and goodness and, and transcendence through the person of Jesus and personally connecting with us. 
uh, and we want to give you the praise for that. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you all for being with us this morning uh, for worshiping with Quest from your house or wherever you are watching this. Uh, it's great to have you here and to, to get to share this time together. Uh, as we close, I want to encourage you guys to check us out next week where we will be digging in to another, uh, another element of what and why to talk about sovereignty and God being providential in the midst of a suffering world. It's going to be really, really good. And we want to uh, just pray that you have a great Sunday and rest of the week. God be with you.